Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Today is our second episode in our three-part series on the poetry of Emily Dickinson. Last week, we focused on her style, the context in which we find her work, and we looked at two of her most famous poems that were titled, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, and this is my letter to the world. Uh, today, we focus on our fascinating personal story and read three more uh, poems that are fan favorites. There is so much we don't know about this woman, but that has not kept the world from surmising, which is, uh, <laughs> to use a word she likes to use, um, surmising about her love interest and her mental health and her personality and her ambition. There have been many attempts to create a definitive biographical sketch of her life, but that's impossible. Uh, she was too secretive immediately after her death. Per her request, with the exception of her poetry, Vinny, her sister, burned all of her personal letters and notes. And later on, her brother and sister-in-law, Susan, redacted or got rid of many of the letters in their possession, you know, really further protecting her legacy and her mystery. <laughs> right. And... And partly that's why she fascinates us. She is a myth, as they say in Amherst. The only biographer who ever knew her was her niece, Mrs. Martha Dickinson Bianchi. In 1914, 27 years after her death, Bianchi published a book of her poetry titled The Single Hand. In the introduction, she defiantly challenges the accepted public persona that these other biographers had created of her aunt. They had painted her as this austere, death-obsessed, anxiety-ridden agoraphobe. This is what uh, her niece says. I am told she is taught in colleges as a rare, strange being, a weird recluse eating her heart out in morbid and unhappy longing or a victim of unsatisfied passion. I have heard her called an epigrammic Walt Whitman by a noted lecturer, and only recently a distinguished foreign critic pronounced her the greatest mystic America has produced, second only to Walt Raldo Emerson. But to her niece and nephews, she was of fairy lineage, akin to the frost on the nursery pane in winter or the hummingbird of midsummer. The realization of our vivid fancy, the confederate in every contraband desire, the very spirit of Never Never Land. She adored us, her three child lovers, talked to us as if we were grown up in our opinions of importance, our secrets pretentious, though always keeping herself our playmate with such art that she remains in my memory as a little girl herself. Once when my brother Ned as a child stood looking up at the evening star, he said wistfully, I want to go up there, Aunt Emily. All right, she cried. Go get your horse and buggy and we'll go tonight. One other charm was unique to her, her way of flitting like a shadow upon the hillside, a motion known to no other mortal. I was usually left with her while both families went to church on Sabbath mornings and well remember being escorted by her to the cool hoarding cellar past the wine closet to a mysterious cupboard of her own where she dealt me lawless cake and other goodies that even a child of four knew was for excess, sure to be followed by disaster later in the day. She put more excitement into the event of a dead fly than her neighbors got from a journey by stagecoach to Boston. If art is ad exaggeration apropos as Mira May claims, she was an incomparable artist at life. Fascination was her element. Unlike the dullard, brilliancy was no effort for her. She reveled in the wings of her mind. I had almost said the fins, too. So universal was her identification with every form of life and element of being. She usually liked men better than women because they were more stimulating. I can hear her yet standing in the spacious upper hall a summer afternoon, finger on lip, and hear her say as the feminine callers took their departure, Listen, Hear them kiss the traitors. To most women, she was a provoking puzzle. To her, in turn, most women were a form of triviality to be escaped when feasible. But stupidity had no sex with her, and I equally well remember her spying down upon a stranger sent to call upon her by a mutual friend and dismissing him unreceived after one glance from her window, remarking, 
His face is as handsome as a meaningless as the full moon. At another time, she called me to peep at a new professor recently come to the college, saying, Look, dear, he is pretty as cloth, cloth pink, her mouth curling in derision as she uttered it in one hand motion as if to throw the flower away. She had a dramatic way of throwing up her hands at the climax of the story or to punctuate one of her own flashes. It was entirely spontaneous. Her spirit seemed merely playing through her body as the aurora borealis through darkness. She was not daily bread. She was stardust. Her solitude made her and was part of her. Taken from her distant sky, she must have become a creature as different as a fallen meteor from a pulsing star. One may ask of the finks if life would not be dearer to live, lived as other women lived, to have been in essence more as other women were, or if in doing so she would have missed that inordinate compulsion, that inquisitive comprehension that made her Emily Dickinson. It is to ask again the old riddle of genius against everyday happiness. Had life or love been able to dissuade her from that eternal preoccupation with death, which thralled her, if she could have chosen... You urge still unconvinced, but I feel that she could and did, and that nothing could have compensated her for the forfeit of that single hound, which was her own identity. Martha Dickinson Bianchi. Gary, what do you think of her niece's description of her? <laughs> oh, well, it's not a one-dimensional stereotype of the ghost woman who kept herself locked in a bedroom. She actually sounds like a lot of fun. I thought so, too. I mean, Bianchi's description was longer than even that, you know, very long excerpt that I just read. But she's got a wonderful sense of humor and energy and passion for speaking truth and defying convention. I mean, sure, she's reclusive and she struggled with anxiety and you know she's multi-dimensional like most of us are but Dickinson understood better than anyone that seemingly conflicting things can be true so let's start from the beginning that's her hallmark apparently you know <laughs> well uh for starters the Dickinsons were an old and distinguished puritanical family that could trace their lineage all the way back to 1630 um their ancestors came over with John Winthrop her grandfather helped found both Amherst Academy and Amherst College, uh, again, very prestigious, uh, except he made the mistake of tying his personal fortune, including the family home, to those schools. Uh, this mistake led to bankruptcy and the loss of their home right before Emily was born, uh, a home three generations of Dickinsons were living in at the time. He and his wife moved to Ohio, his son Edward, and his family moved across town to a house on Pleasant Street. Now, Edward Dickinson's wife, uh, Emily's mother, was also named Emily. Does that make her a feminine, <laughs> a feminine junior? I guess so. She was from another local and prominent family. And Emily, the daughter, was the middle child. Her brother Austin was two years older, and Lavinia, or Vinnie, was three years younger. The three Kids were extremely close, and Emily's father was a proud, um, austere, and successful but distant man. Uh, if you just read what people wrote about him, he seems even kind of unkind. True, but even so, it's very clear that Emily loved her father, and her father loved her. She described him right after he died years later like this. His heart was pure and terrible. And I think no other like it exists. <laughs> Pure and terrible. Yeah. Well, you know, she always saw the dualities in life, um, even in the case of her father. Uh, in his case, however, I I'm not sure he was very different from many men of that generation. Um, he was a, a successful and busy lawyer, the treasurer of Amherst College, and left everything in the household to be run by the women. And he viewed himself and was viewed as a landmark in the community. And one thing I do find that's interesting is that uh, neither of the Dickinson girls married. And when Austin married, he planned on moving west, but his father bribed him with a very large house and a job to stay around. Uh, in fact, to move to a house that was literally next door to the family home, the homestead, after uh, Edward was able to buy it back and redeem the family reputation. That's close quarters. <laughs> well, you know, this is a family with a lot of community pride. And uh, we'll speculate a little about why Emily never married. I mean, maybe it was just because she didn't have to, because of money. Both she and Vinnie 
you know, had financial freedom. They had the option to live independently, and they chose to do that for the rest of their life. I mean, it's interesting when you think that almost 1,789 poems written by her were likely written in the same room. (laughs) You know, uh, I'm not sure in 1840 uh, that anyone would have guessed that. Um, You know, Emily was not all that different than the other upper-class school girls attending Amherst Academy. Well, she was a prodigy. Uh, I think everyone knew that after seven years at Amherst Academy, they figured it out. The principal said this about Dickinson's writing, and I quote, Her compositions were strikingly original and always attracted much attention at school, and I'm afraid excited not a little bit of envy. (laughs) You know, but beyond being an exceptional student, she was a typical girl. She had four classes. She took, listen to these classes, mental philosophy, (laughs) geology, Latin and botany, and she wrote in the margins of her books. She hung out with a group of girls they called the Five. Uh, she said this about her teachers. You know I am always in love with my teachers. <laughs> I wish my students felt that way. <laughs> there was nothing to suggest from Emily's childhood that she would be anything but a prominent and typical Amherst lady. Um, and she said this one time, I am growing handsome very fast indeed. I expect I shall be the bell of Amherst when I reach my 17th year. I don't doubt that I will have crowds of admirers at that age. Those were her words. Aww. Well, I will say moving houses was traumatic and a big deal at the time. Emily loved the Pleasant Street house. She lived there from age 9 to 25. It's the house that was right next to the cemetery, the one where you know she watched all those people get buried, her childhood friends who had died from tuberculosis. They were buried next door. Well, neighbors were very quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Uh, you know, th- this was not atypical for this time period. I mean, e- everyone was struggling with these threats, uh, but she had a fairly tight support group. And she had those friends that uh, that were called the five. She also met her best friend, Susan Gilbert, during this period. That relationship is the most fascinating uh, and perhaps the most significant of all her relationships. Uh, Susan was born nine days after Emily on December 19th, 1830. Some would have said they were nearly twins. <laughs> Susan was an intellectual companion, you know, an emotional support, and really eventually a defender of her legacy. And I really like Susan. I mean, both of the girls were brilliant and highly educated. Uh, but where Emily was reclusive, you know, Susan was the life of the party. They both loved music, they both loved gardening, and of course, they both loved Austin, although that does get complicated in the (laughs) later years. It will. You know, Susan and Austin started dating in 1815. She was 20. They got engaged on Thanksgiving Day in 1853, but they didn't get married until July of 1856, Um, and that was a year after the Dickinsons moved back into the homestead. Uh, They would either talk or correspond almost every day, multiple times a day, almost to the end of Emily's life. You know, that is interesting. And to think, you know, uh, they did have very different lives. At age 17, Emily went to college. Yes, and and that is an extremely elite thing to do for this period, Um, although less unusual in in that part of the country. But Susan did not attend college. Um, She was an orphan and lived with an older sister until she married Austin. Emily, on the other hand, attended Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, but just for one year, which wasn't all that unusual for the time. But in her case, seminary was stressful. Uh, First, and we talked about this last episode, her father stressed over her health, and her parents' stress obviously created anxiety for her. Secondly, she missed home, which isn't extremely unusual. But lastly, and uh, perhaps most interestingly for us today, was her problematic relationship with religious dogma. There was a notable problem, uh, in no small part, (laughs) because this was a seminary, and its primary purpose was to train female missionaries. The college was science-based, and the the founder was a female chemist, and it promoted independent thinking, and it was a great school. Uh, It did not see faith and science as clashing or combative. Uh, However, it it was a religious school, and they wanted all the girls to be converted Christians. In order to make this happen, students were tracked into three groups. Imagine this. 
The first group were girls who professed Christianity. The second were those who were amenable to Christianity. But the third consisted of girls who were, and I quote, without hope. (laughs) That's so bad. Dickinson, uh, with 80 others, were put into group number three. And uh, when she left, uh, along with 29 others, they were still in a group. The number was... (laughs) Three. <laughs> I'm in group number three. That's terrible. <laughs> well, I really don't think neither she uh, nor the school were really trying to be cruel. I mean, everyone wanted the best. When you read her letters, when she talks about this problem, there's sincerity there. The problem was that for Emily, joining the church was not something she could just do because other people wanted her to. She just couldn't fake it. At one point, there was a service at the seminary, and and this is a story that they tell, and and the founder of the school asked all the girls who wanted to be Christians to stand up, and Emily was the only one who (laughs) didn't stand up. She wrote about it in a letter, and she says this, They thought it queer I didn't rise. I thought a lie would be queerer. Ooh. (laughs) Well, you know, this honesty is all over her writing about faith, and she does have a faith, and uh, I don't think you can read her work and not see that. She sincerely believes in God and immortality, and uh, her problem was that she could never accept easy answers or cliched thinking, and so she never formally aligned herself, uh, really, nor even attended church. I mean, she had trouble with doctrine and dogma. And this inability to be like everyone else bothered her, especially when it came to religion. In a letter to Abia, her friend, she says this, I hope at some time the heavenly gates will be open to receive me and the angels will consent to call me sister. I am continually putting off becoming a Christian. Evil voices lisp in my ear. There is yet time enough. I feel that every day I live in sin more and more and closing my heart to the offers of mercy, which are presented to me freely. (laughs) You know, it's isolating to not be like everyone else. And isolation is another big topic for Emily. It's difficult to feel alone and not be understood. Yes, and Emily experienced this and she wrote about it. In her 20s and in her 30s, Emily began to retreat more and more into herself. Of course, we have to surmise as to why, but, you know, society basically just became a struggle for her. It's during her 20s and early 30s also that she started really taking seriously her poetry. One poem that came out of this era reflects a little of her self-awareness. It's been numbered poem 620. Much madness is divinest sense. Uh, I think maybe this poem reflects what she felt like during the transition from the period of being this young, lively girl who wants to be the belle of Amherst to a woman who could not make herself conform. Much madness is divinest sense. To a discerning eye, much sense, the starkest madness. Tis the majority in this, as all, prevail assent, and you are sane, demure, you're straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. You know, uh, Dickinson, as every great poet, is something of a psychologist, and she studies herself. Uh, this poem uh, also uses dashes and capital letters, and much madness is capitalized, sense is capitalized, but divinest is not. The word madness looks like it could be a pun. The word mad means to be crazy, but it also means to be angry. Both ways make sense, however you read it. Yes, and two things can both be true. I mean, this is obviously a poem of protest. It is angry. The world is blind to its own craziness. I is capitalized. You know, she's saying, if you look, you'll notice what the majority thinks is crazy. Uh... Those things are correct, but whenever what everybody thinks is correct is absolutely stupid. There's a chiasmus, but she's mad about it because if you just go along with the craziness, then people think you're sane. But if you question the insanity, you're dangerous and you get locked up in, you know, figuratively or in her case, maybe even literally. I mean, chain is capitalized. You know, knowing what she's going to say, let's read it again. It's just 30 words. Much madness is divinest sense, to a discerning eye, much sense, the starkest madness. 
Tis the majority in this as all prevail. Ascent, you are saying, demur, you're straightway dangerous and handled with a chain. You know, between 1858 to 1865, in other words, between ages 28 to 35, she wrote over 800 poems. And after composing them, drafting them out, she recopied them on really nice stationery. She is, then she carefully assembled them into 40 little booklets. She sewed these booklets together herself, and they've been called fascicles. Sometimes, you know, she would share drafts of these poems that would eventually be in these books with friends. Lots of times she'd sent them over to Susan for Susan to read them, maybe make comments or edit. I mean, she was on fire during these years. 1862 alone, that's her most creative year. She wrote 366 final draft poems. Wow. One a day, apparently. (laughs) Final draft. It takes, uh, you know, poets usually take a lot more time. I to do know. That. Well, maybe she did, but that's the year that they all got put together. 1862 was an important year for another reason. Um, in April 1862, Dickinson did something that she later claimed saved her life and certainly changed the course of American literature. Um, there was an essayist and political activist named Thomas Wentworth Higginson. He was a, a very outspoken feminist and abolitionist. Uh, so much so that during the Civil War, he commanded the first federally authorized unit of African-American soldiers and spent the rest of his life supporting increased political rights for both African-Americans and women. Yes, and she connected with him, not because of his social activism, but because of an article that he wrote for the Atlantic Monthly in April of 1862. The letter was titled, Letter to a Young Contributor. And in this article, he offers advice to would-be writers who want to publish. And and let me quote him. He says this, If, therefore, duty and opportunity call, count it a privilege to obtain your share. Well, Dickinson decided she wanted to, and she responded by sending him four poems. We play at Paste, I'll Tell You How the Sun Rose, The Nearest Dream Recedes, Unrealized, and safe in their alabaster chambers. It ends up becoming a famous poem. He kept her letter. Let's read it. Mr. Higginson, are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is alive? The mind is so near itself, it cannot see distinctly, and I have none to ask. Should you think it breathed, and had you the leisure to tell me, I should feel quick gratitude. If I make the mistake that you dare to tell me would give me sincere honor toward you. I enclose my name asking you, if you please, sir, to tell me what is true. That you will not betray me, it is needless to ask, since honors is its own pawn. My gosh, I mean, this letter is written in the same style as her poem. She didn't (laughs) break from it. She had dashes and capital letters and even in this letter. I know, and and there's a lot that people discuss about what should be considered, you know, a poem. Is this a poem? Is this a letter? I mean, getting a letter from Dickinson sometimes is like getting a riddle. (laughs) But this particular letter, I mean, it was unsigned. And inside the envelope, she put a smaller envelope. And inside the smaller envelope, she had a card with her name written in pencil on it. I mean, Higginson read her poems, and he wrote back immediately. We don't know what he said because, you know, Benny burned all her letters. But we do know that the relationship took off. It it would be eight years until they would ever meet face to face. But they wrote continuously until one month before uh, Emily Dickinson died. She referenced herself. This kind of cracks me up. In all of her letters to Higginson as your scholar, although he never considered himself to be... (laughs) meritorious of this designation. <laughs> well, what's also amusing is the one time she chose to change that up. Um, there exists a letter that Emily wrote to him while he was off fighting in the Civil War. And in that letter, she signs off as his gnome. <laughs> why in the world? Uh, yeah, I have no idea why. <laughs> well, in Emily's second letter to Mr. Higginson, she references him doing surgery on her letters. I guess he tried to edit them. But more importantly than that, she references something that has been a mystery ever since. 
This is the second letter dated April 26, 1862. That's not long after the first one. Mr. Higginson, your kindness claimed earlier gratitude, but I was ill and write today from my pillow. Thank you for the surgery. It was not so painful as I supposed. I bring you others, as you ask, that they might not differ. While my thought is undressed, I can make the distinction, but when I put them in the gown, they look alike and numb. You ask how old I was. I made no verse but one or two until this winter, sir. I had a terror last September. I could tell to no one, and so I sing as the boy does by the burying ground because I am afraid. And that's the line that gets everyone. I had a terror since September. Nobody knows what a terror is. What happened to her? Whatever that ha- that happened to her has been directly connected to her decision to withdraw. Obviously, there's been no shortage of speculation. Uh, lots of people think it has to do with a lover. Uh, if we keep reading, we, we won't. But if we were to read the same letter, she actually talks about one to Higginson in this letter. So there's that theory. A second theory is health related. Maybe she was having epileptic seizures and, and she couldn't leave the house because of medical reasons. A third theory is that maybe she was having panic attacks, some sort of depression or another psychological order. And it was the psychological part that kept her feeling afraid and unable to leave the house. We know that uh, Emily's mother struggled with depression and serious anxiety herself. And some think uh, that she inherited these traits biologically or culturally from her mother. I mean, One public example of Emily's mother's anxiety happened when Emily was 25. Right after the big move from the Pleasant House to the homestead, Emily's mother got sick with an unidentifiable illness and stayed bedridden for the next four years. Emily and her sister were forced to take over every household responsibility. Uh, The mother relegated herself to the position of a child in their care. And this is how Emily described it. I don't know what mother's sickness is, for I am but a simple child and rightened at myself. I often wish I was a grass or a toddling daisy, whom all the problems of the dust do not terrify. Oh, she wasn't a child, but I understand what she feels like. You know, the years between 1855 and 1865 have been called Emily's writing years. Uh, These were also big years for Susan and Austin. Their house was the hub for the social activity of Amherst. It's full of parties. Anyone of importance who came to Amherst came next door. It was full of life. Emily's house, where her mother was laying down, was cold and lonely. I mean, Susan was smart and extroverted, and everyone wanted to get an invitation to the Evergreens. That was the name of their house. And at first, you know, Emily participated in all of that. She participated in the social life, and she enjoyed her brother's growing family. Um, They had three children, and Emily, to the day she died, was close to every single one of them. But by the time that Emily turned 35, she was done with this. She had pretty much committed herself to only wearing white, and she had pulled out. She was in full-on withdrawal mode. Another big event that may have had a role in her withdrawal uh, is Edward's election to Congress in 1852. Emily, in 1855, went to Washington. She spent a few weeks there, uh, but most interestingly, on her way back, she stopped in Philadelphia where she heard a preacher, Reverend Charles Wadsworth, and he made quite an impression. You know, it seems they corresponded for many years, and many have speculated that she was in love with him Although this, you know, love wasn't reciprocal, he was married and had two kids, and there's no indication of anything beyond correspondence between the two. But there are drafts of love letters that were never mailed uh, that might have been intended for him. Well, also, Emily wrote quite a bit of very romantic poetry, but the letters that you're talking about today, we call them the master letters because she refers to somebody in the letters as master have left everyone questioning. I mean, they're definitely drafts of romantic letters, but nobody knows who they were for, if they were really for anyone, or if they were for different people. Uh, Which brings me to one of my personal favorites of all of Dickinson's poems. 
Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. <laughs> Poem number 1129. Tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies too bright for our infirm delight. The truth's superb surprise as lightning to the children eased with explanation kind. The truth must dazzle gradually or every man be blind. So what do you like about that? I identify with it and I agree with it. It's biblical even. I mean, I think Emily references, she's referencing the Bible here. Now, Jesus said at least six times, and I quote, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. I mean, that's a strange thing to say. Everyone has ears, except we don't. <laughs> a lot of us don't have ears. We can't, we can't hear things. And Emily sees this problem. She says it this way, tell the truth, but tell it slant. In other words, tell the truth. It's important to tell the truth, but you really have to be careful. You can only successfully be honest if you talk in circles. Success in circuit lies. The truth is too bright. It's like how we talk about lightning to children so they aren't afraid. You must bring people to truth gradually. You know, if you've ever had anything difficult to tell somebody, you understand exactly what she's talking about. Oh, I agree completely. I mean, she attempts to be forcefully honest in her correspondence as well as her work, but it seems to have taken a toll. Um, after those war years, she receded more and more, you know, claiming she was only completely free when she was alone in her room. Uh, it's an interesting thing to say coming from a literal genius who loved engaging ideas. I mean, her brother's house was the intellectual center of Amherst, and everyone who was anyone went there. Uh, even Ralph Waldo Emerson, a man who likely inspired uh, her to write and whose work she kept close to her her entire life. Uh, not even his presence was enough to draw her out. You know, maybe it was her anxiety. Maybe it was the role and expectations for women in the 19th century New England. You know, maybe it was her eyesight. Uh, we haven't talked about her brush with blindness, but that was a deeply impactful and traumatic experience. And, uh, you know, any or all of these things led to her eventual detachment. Yeah, I guess we should mention, you know, Emily started documenting problems with her eyes in September of 1863. Up to that point, you know, she had incredible vision. But she began to complain of pain and light sensitivity. You know, her words, she said this, that her sight got crooked. In 1864, she went to Boston and, and she w underwent several treatments. And although it's unlikely that they did much, you know, she talked about just being scared that she would lose her ability to read. After she got back from Boston, Dixon is not known to have gone anywhere else Again, nor did she receive a lot of callers. Her eyes did improve. And she did continue to write letters and poems, but nothing like the pace of her 20s and 30s. From 1865 until her death in 1886, she only averaged 35 poems a year from that point onward. Well, that's a huge drop off. It really is. You know, uh, Higginson still wanted to meet Emily in person, and he tried to get her to come see him. Uh, but she didn't leave the house. Um, she wrote him this. I do not cross my father's ground to any house in town. So he came to her. He wrote his wife about it on August 16th, 1870, and described what it was like meeting her. A step like a pattering child in entry, and in glided a little plain woman with two smooth bands of reddish hair and a face a little like Belle Dove, not plainer, with no good feature, in a very plain and exquisitely clean white peak and a blue net worsted shawl. She came to me with two day lilies, which she put in a sort of childlike way into my hand and said, These are my introduction. In a soft, frightened, breathless, childlike voice, and added under her breath, Forgive me if I am frightened. I never see strangers and hardly know what I say. But she talked soon and thenceforward continuously and deferentially, sometimes stopping to ask me to talk instead of her, but readily recommencing. Aww. <laughs> you know, she would have been 40 at the time, but it does seem very childlike. Uh, her relationships um, after making a decision to retreat 
into the house did not change a whole lot. She was close to her father, and when he died in 1874, this was a huge blow to her. He left for Boston one day for the state legislature. While there, during a speech on the floor, he felt faint, and he sat down. That evening, he sent for a doctor, but he died three hours later. And this is what she said. When I think of my father's lonely life and lonelier death, there is this redress. Take all away. The only thing worth larceny is left, the immortality. You know, her mother, a year almost to the day, had a stroke that left her paralyzed. And Emily and her sister, again, took care of her for the next seven years until she died in 1882. That could not have been easy. But Emily bonded with her mom during those years. She said this, We were never intimate mother and child while she was our mother, but when she became our child, the affection came. In 1878, one of Emily's poems was published in a book of poetry, Mask of Poets. It is the only poem of hers to have ever been published in a book during her lifetime. The poem she wrote originally in 1859, and it was published anonymously during the war in 1864. But in 1878, Emily's close friend, Helen Hunt Jackson, who was a popular writer at the time, begged Dickinson to let her put it in this anthology. She told Dickinson that the poem would, let me quote her, it would give pleasure to somebody somewhere whom you do not know. Now, scholars aren't really sure that Dickinson ever agreed to let her friend publish it, but she did anyway. And Jackson wrote Emily and said this, I suppose by this time you have seen The Mask of Poets. I hope you have not regretted giving me that choice bit of verse for it. We don't really know how Emily felt about the publication of her poem or anything else. We do know that after her father's death, she did open up emotionally to one man. She began a passionate relationship with a man 18 years older than her, Judge Otis Phillips Lord. He even proposed, although she declined. And this is how she declined. Don't you know you are happiest while I withhold and not confer? Don't you know that no is the wildest word we can sign to language? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in 1883, uh, Dickinson's heart was broken beyond repair, but not by Judge Lord. Um, her eight-year-old nephew, Gilbert Dickinson, uh, Sue and Austin's son, died of typhoid fever. And within a few weeks, she became ill. She completely locked herself away, saw absolutely no one, not even Susan. And in 1884, Judge Lord died. In 1885, Helen Jackson died. And in May of 1886, she fell into a coma and very soon after that passed away. You know, I want to end with that poem that Helen Jackson published. It's ironic to think that Emily never knew that she succeeded. She uses in this poem the imagery of war, the taking of the flag in a battle. She uses it to express how it feels to win, but you can only understand what it feels to win if you also know what it feels like to lose. Success is counted sweetest by those who ne'er succeed. To comprehend a nectar requires sorest need. Not one of all the purple host who took the flag today can tell the definition so clear of victory. As he defeated, dying, on whose forbidden ear the distant strains of triumph burst agonized and clear. Dickinson never knew it. She never knew that she won and that she would become one of the greatest writers in the English language. Her business was circumference, that's what she says, and it reaches across time and space. Well, thank you for listening to this episode today. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed reviewing the life and the legacy of Emily Dickinson as much as we have. As always, if you did, please share this episode with a friend. Uh, in the way that you share things that you support, text it, post it, email it, play it for your students in class. When you share, we grow. Also, you can always reach out to us on our website at howtolovelitpodcast.com. You can download listening guides as well as buy merchandise for your friends and family. Thanks again. Peace out. <laughs>